talk about the process of transformation. Look at your neighbor say transformation. I love that word and, and I love transformation when I think about revival. I love transformation when I think about what God has done in my life personally. And that word, it, it means this. It means transformation. It means a fundamental change in a location, or in the heart or life of an individual. A fundamental change in a location, or in the heart or life of an individual. And I think this is what we need right now more than ever before. See, in Acts chapter 1, they needed transformation in the land. More than anything, there was so much persecution. There was so much fear. There was so much hatred of, of, of Jesus' teachings and of the, of the early church. It's okay. It's just a hallelujah. That's, that's perfect praise right there. <laughs> but they needed a transformation in the culture, and this is what we need today. If we're going to see real revival and real reformation, we need, it starts with transformation. And transformation is the fundamental change in a location or in the heart of an individual. Something has to begin to shift if we're going to see our society change, if we're going to see our government change, if we're going to see anything in the world change. It has to start with the church, with us as individuals, with our families, and uh, and. You know, I was, as I was just praying into this, I was thinking of this. It's, it's funny how the Lord speaks to me sometimes, and he speaks to me through movies. He speaks to me through all kinds of random uh, things. But I was with my kids. Heather and I were with the kids, and, and uh, Olivia had a little science project, and she had to get a ladybug farm. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so we had a bunch of pet ladybugs. <laughs> uh, and... We, uh, we got the ladybug farm, and you have to order away for all these little, these little ladybugs, and they come in this little tube, and, and they're just itty-bitty little, you know, they're not even, they don't look anything like a ladybug. They're the little larva, and they're kind of crawling around. And so you put the food in the farm, and you have to drop some water in there, and then you drop all your little ladybugs. And, and so we're, we're watching these guys, and, and they're just cruising around. They're just crawling everywhere, and eating so much, and you have to keep feeding them, and you have to keep giving them water and all this stuff. And day by day, they just kind of keep growing. Isn't that funny how that happens? <laughs> they just keep growing, and they kind of keep changing. And all of a sudden, about a week into the process, uh, they begin to transform. And they take this new shape, which is called the pupa. 
It's kind of this little blob of yellow. <laughs> they still look nothing like a ladybug, you know, and, uh, but they become this pupa, this kind of little adolescent bug, and they're cruising around, and then all of a sudden, when they've had enough to eat, when they've had enough to drink, they attach themselves to a leaf, to the wall, to something, and they begin the process. Say process. They are invited at this moment. They are invited into the process that is going to be somewhat painful because their body and everything in them is going to transform. It's kind of like the butterfly. When the butterfly is in that cocoon, which we also saw with our kids last year, it is, it is quite incredible. The, their body, the caterpillar, liquefies, and something so supernatural, so just Jesus, happens inside that cocoon, and they come out this beautiful butterfly, right? It's, it's only the Lord could do something like that. And then, but the, the ladybug is, is pretty amazing as well. And so it's, in, it's sitting on the side of this wall, and they begin to go through this metamorphosis, this transformation. And all of a sudden, about a week later, they start turning into ladybugs. And I'm like, whoa, how did you go from an ugly little bug <laughs> to a blob, to a cute little ladybug in two weeks. And they're flying around, and they, they're perfectly, you know, red, and they got the spots and everything. And, and God just kind of began to start speaking to me through this, as he always does, but he just began to speak to me about transformation. And transformation takes time. And transformation is a process. And the Lord will often invite us into process. And we see this throughout scriptures, and I'm going to give you a couple. But, but think about this little ladybug, for, in, for example, if, if any of them, and there was many, there was about 15 or 20. But what, what if one of them was like, no, I'm cool. Like, I just, I don't want the, the process. I'm a ladybug. <laughs> I just, I'm a ladybug. I just, I believe I'm a ladybug. But they haven't gone through the process. And so all the friends are like, actually, you're not a ladybug. <laughs> look at us. We're flying, and we're, we look a little bit different. We're ladybugs. See, we have to walk through to get to where God wants us to go. And we can't rush the process, and the process requires great patience. Patience is a great virtue, and patience is something, it's just a lost art. The art of patience. Hallelujah. And this happens throughout the animal kingdom, mostly in the insect world, um, but it also happens we see with frogs, and there's some fish, and you know, one of my favorites, which is, is different, and it would be the most uh, probably similar to kind of what some people go through, would be the eagle. And the eagle goes through this process called the molting process which is kind of a process of death. And they've come to this point in their life where they are the eagle, like the, the, the beautiful, majestic, bald eagle. Like, I mean, it can take out any snake, anything. Like, it can fly high, perfect vision. I mean, we love the eagle, it's, right? It's just so beautiful. But about 40 years in to its life, it goes through this, process called the molting process, where it begins to lose its feathers, it loses its beak, it loses its talons, it loses the calcium in its bones, so it can't even keep its head up. Everything that was once amazing about this majestic bird begins to get totally stripped away, and it looks like a chicken. And so it's like, hey, hey, ladies, <laughs> it's me, I'm the eagle. No, you ain't an eagle, you're a chicken. <laughs> so if you're dating somebody that says they're an eagle, you know, and they look like a chicken, say so you need to endure the process a little bit. But what happens with this eagle, it's pretty powerful. They, the only thing they can really do is climb up on a rock and sit there and wait. And they, it, it's just, it's, if you, you could see it on National Geographic or wherever you look it up, but they'll crawl on the highest rock that they can get to, and they position themselves to be looking directly into the sun. That's awesome and prophetic right there. But the sun begins to shine on these birds and gives them vitamin D, and then other birds, other eagles begin to fly overhead, and, 
And they can't even hunt themselves. They can't even eat for themselves. And now these other birds that have gone through the process recognize that what they're going through, and they begin to drop food. They don't, only, they don't only just drop food, but they crush up, and they eat the food, and then drop it like, a, like it's like a newborn baby. This is powerful. This is why we need each other, right? And so this bird begins to eat. This little chicken-looking bird begins to eat. And all of a sudden, after some time goes by, it's not a quick process, but some time goes by and feathers begin to come back. Uh, talons begin to come back. A beak begins to come and get restored. The vision is even better than what it was before. And that bird takes flight. And it lives for another 40 years. But the thing with that is, there's a moment when the eagle has a decision. I'm either going to give up and die or I'm going to move on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing. As painful as it might be, as hard as this season is going to be, I'm going to do this. And lots of eagles, they just die. They just, they just give up strength. They lose hope and they just die. And, but there's many, many, many that just keep going, and they take flight again, and it's almost this rebirth experience. Hallelujah. That's a good word. Some of you need that today. <laughs> Come on. Amen. You have an eagle's nest? Praise God. <laughs> That's so good. Come on. I want to I see that. So good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So the process of transformation, we see it in the eagle. We see it in the, in the ladybug. And the Lord was just speaking to me as we're, as we're letting these little ladybugs go into the wild. And, and God's speaking to me like, there's a process that I'm inviting you into. And, I, and, and there's a process that I feel like God wants to invite every single one of you in this room into today. And you're, a lot of you are already in it, but I just want to remind you from a few places in Scripture. We won't take too long. But one of those, one of those amazing stories of transformation obviously would happen in the life of Saul. So let me see Saul. I love the story of Saul who gets turned into Paul. But he was riding on his horse. He was, you know, he was just a bad dude, and he was killing Christians. He stood there as Stephen was being martyred. He was dragging uh, Christians out of their homes, um, just leading the charge in persecuting, but not just persecuting, really wanting to eradicate the church and eradicate anything uh, of Jesus off the face of the earth. This was his goal. This was his mission. And all of a sudden, in the midst of his darkness, in the midst of his bad decisions, he's on his way to Damascus. We know the story. And Jesus shows up in a bright light. And it says, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, well, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and I will tell you what you must do. And the men journeyed with him, who st and they stood speechless, I guess so, hearing a voice, but they saw no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, but when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand, and they brought him to Damascus. And he was there for three days with no sight, and he neither drank nor nor ate food. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and he said, the Lord said to him in a vision, here I am, Lord. Arise, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Hallelujah. So we know the rest of the story. He, uh, he leads him out. But, but there was a process that Saul was invited into as he has this amazing encounter with, with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And it was this three days 
of no sight. It was this three days of, okay, I'm having visions, I'm seeing things, I'm hearing God, that my life, everything that I knew my life to be up until this point is completely changing. And it was a full-on transformation of everything in his spirit, his soul, and his body. And he lived a transformed life. And the rest of his life, he, he lived this, he walked this, he walked out this message of full transformation. And he experienced it from the inside out, right? And I love what it says in, in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, amen, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so the, Paul had this understanding of transformation. I think, I really believe he had a real revelation. And what he's beginning to teach us here is that transformation begins with this word called sacrifice, and he used, I believe he used this word sacrifice because it was something that the people of this time could really connect with. And so he's like, why? You know, look, look at Jewish culture and, and during this time, Hebrew culture and, and the Middle East and everything. It's animal sacrifices. The atonement for your sins would, you'd have to bring a, a, a goat, a sheep, a different animal. There was all these different animals you would have to sacrifice. And so the people understood this. This analogy, I remember seeing this when I went to India and, you know, I was driving down the street and we're passing these temples and, the, and you know, open, there was no windows and no doors. You could see right into there. And I remember just driving so slow. There's like an elephant in front of us. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's crazy. It's, uh, India is, is crazy. It's, it just messes up all your senses. And um, but I remember looking to my right and there's a temple, and there's these men carrying this sheep. It's alive. It's totally, it was alive. And they're carrying the sheep, and they place them up on top of the altar. And I'm like watching this, and I'm like, everything kind of looks like slow motion. All of a sudden, this guy, who must have been like the high priest or something, puts up a big knife, and, and, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm just, I'm traumatized. Like, what's happening? But it was very normal for most cultures and for most religions in the world, this is very normal. And so Paul is using something that's very normal that their mind can understand, sacrifice. But then he takes it a step further, and it's not about the sacrifice of an animal. It's not about the sacrifice of all these exterior things. It's about bringing your life. Huh. So he's teaching us, and he says every part of us needs to be offered to God as a sacrifice. Our mind, our heart, our mouth, our body. Every part of us. You, you bring it to the altar, and you, you lay it on the altar. Every part of you. you if you've got a problem with cussing, just bring your mouth to the altar. Lay, lay it down on the altar. Your body, your mind, every part of you, you lay it on the altar of God and and. Paul is expressing, he's saying, this is a pleasing sacrifice. This is worship. And really, this is transformation. And he mentions the transformation with the renewing of your mind. See, this is where it starts. And many times, we, we, there's a block because we're not renewing our mind with the scriptures, with the word of God. And you have to get past the war in your mind begin, before you can begin to really engage in the battle. And so whatever that thing is, that lie, that whisper, you've got to just take control of the lies in your mind with the scriptures, with the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. Amen. And you begin to move forward. And so I thank you, Paul, for teaching us about transformation. But there's many others. I love, I love the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Climbed up in that sycamore tree. Oh, it's just coming to me. I, I, <laughs> it's the song of the Lord right now. <laughs> for the Lord, he wanted to see. <laughs> No, Zacchaeus, he was, he was a tax collector. And he wasn't just a tax collector. The Bible says he was the chief tax collector. And so we know that he had people working under him. And we know historically that if you were a tax collector, especially a chief tax collector, that you had to kind of, you were kind of like a slave master. 
and you are making many people under you just kind of be that mean person to, to be greedy, to rip off people in the communities, to take the money, take everything that they owe you. And so people did not like Zacchaeus. Why? Because of the greed, because of the selfishness, because of the lust and the love for money. But it took one moment with Jesus, one encounter with Christ, and we see full repentance. We see selfishness change. We see Jesus say, oh, no, you're, you're not too far gone for me. I want to have a meal with you. And he calls him out of that tree. He says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. And Zacchaeus, see, he's known in the community as, as the short one. He's known in the community as the guy who rips us off, the tax collector, the greedy guy. But, but, but Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. And Zacchaeus actually means pure one. And I love how Jesus will always call us by our name, not by what other people have labeled us, not by what the enemy has labeled us. And he has a meal, and he's completely transformed by just hanging out with Christ. Come on, somebody. And one of the greatest stories, which is I just want to hang out here for just a minute, and I, we're already like running way out of time, so I'm, I'm trying to go fast. But the story of, of Abraham. I'm fascinated by the story of Abraham. First, it was Abram, right? I'm just I'm fascinated by this story, which starts in Genesis um, chapter 12. And, you know, Abraham or Abram at that time, he came from a good family. He had he had everything that he needed. They had animals. They had land. They had family. They they were taken care of. There was nothing really that he needed to go and get. But all of a sudden, this Abram in the midst of a good season, here's the Lord. And the Lord speaks to him and says, Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Why am I talking about Abram? Why? Because this was the beginning of the process. You see, sometimes we want that fast thing. We want it to happen so quickly. We, we just, we want the download. We want the, the, the instant miracle. But sometimes there's a backstory. You see, you can look at Abraham's life and you can see Isaac and say, oh, praise the Lord. He's the man that believed. But we don't realize that he was the man that believed for 24 years. He was the man that said, okay, I, I don't understand this process right now. I, I Actually, I have a good life. I love my family. I have land. I have everything that I could need. But you're calling me into the unknown. You, you're, you're, you're beckoning me into the deep. And I don't know where I'm supposed to go, but yet he has a promise. See, he tells us to go somewhere. He tells us to obey something. But then he, he, he comes on and he says, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And you and all the families of the earth will be blessed. Come on. Yes. And so he departed, and he did what the Lord told him to do. Yes. This is just, just precious and so powerful to me. He just he had nothing, and he took that step. He took a risk, and he began to trust the Lord. But he was invited into this process, the process of transformation. And there were many times, if you read the story of Abram and Abraham, there were times when he began to question and he began to doubt. And the Lord would show up and he would speak the word again. He would remind him of the promise. Isn't that what God does in our journey? It's like we're, we're feeling a little fatigued. Man, 2020 was rough, Lord. <laughs> And he'll come in with the promise, and he'll remind you of destiny, and he'll remind you of words that he's spoken over you, right? This is how good he is. This is exactly what he did for Abraham. And, and then we see it kind of all come to a head in, in Genesis chapter 18. And the Lord speaks to, or excuse me, Genesis 17, where he speaks to Abraham. He says, I am Almighty God. Walk before me. 
and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you. And I will multiply you exceedingly. This is this, at this point in his life, he's 99 years old. He got the promise to move into something new and fresh when he was 75 years old. So don't tell me you're too old. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> 75, he gets a new word, a fresh word from the Lord to move into this new adventure. At 99, he gets the word again, and the Lord is saying, this, I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. Hallelujah. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between you and me and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Oh, hallelujah. That's a good word. And how do I know? This is kind of the, 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 the when it all kind of transpires. I, I believe this was the transformation in Abraham's story. See, he was believing the whole time, but he was in process the whole time as well. And what he was believing, he was believing for a son. He was believing that that word, the word, you will be father of many nations, that the, the, being father of many nations starts with having one boy at least. It needs, Isaac needs to come into the earth. <laughs> So he's like, Lord, I'm believing this. I'm believing that you're going to bring absolute transformation to the land and, and that a great people shall come out of me and my wife. But we're getting old, Lord. <laughs> When's this going to happen? And at, as he's 99 years old, the God says, I'm reminding you today, and today I'm changing your name. One chapter later, Isaac is born. Transformation. And that's just so powerful, this process of waiting Waiting is so powerful, and it's the lost art in the body of Christ. And, and like I said just a moment ago, there's always a backstory. You know, we love the woman with the issue of blood, and she just, her raw faith, and she made it through the crowd. I'm going to get Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> and she got her miracle, but we don't realize that there was years and years and years to that woman's story. That there were so many tears, and there was so much brokenness in that woman's story and in her heart. And it brought her to this moment that we all celebrate. The blind Bartimaeus, the blind men that asked for healing, the, the crippled men at the gate called beautiful. Like, there's so many men that have a backstory and women that have a backstory and, and so much brokenness. And they're in the waiting and they don't lose heart in the waiting. And God's just kind of speaking to me that... <laughs> you got to keep your faith and you got to keep your heart right in the waiting. Just like that little ladybug. The ladybug, you know, and, and some, I remember sharing this last year when we were doing the butterflies. And, and there was this, we had like six or seven butterflies. And one, one little butterfly was like just kind of freaking out. And I could tell like, like I don't like the process. <laughs> you know, get me out of here. <laughs> And he was like shaking the thing uncontrollably. All the other ones are just hanging perfectly in their cocoon. And, and he just kept shaking, 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 shaking until the cocoon fell off and hit the ground. And, uh, and then it kind of went into the process finally. But when all the butterflies emerged, that one was deformed. And it couldn't fly. And how many times do we act like this? We get so frustrated in the process we try to shake ourselves out of the process. But just wait. Just wait on the Lord, and he shall renew your strength. That we can actually become stronger and more fortified in the waiting. You know, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Acts chapter 1, I, I, I got I to gotta give you a little bit of Acts today. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. Um, I love this story because it is truly the birth of the church. And, and it was really scary times to be alive. 
the disciples had just saw their Messiah, their King, their Savior just suffer a horrible death. Persecution is on the rise. And now Jesus shows up in his ascended body and he begins to speak to them. And he tells them, to, you're going to go wait, right? For John, oh, let's see, verse 4, 1 verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Somebody say, wait. <laughs> Which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel, or to Israel? And he said that it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. So we say power. power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This... Acts chapter 1, Patrick, you can jump on there. Uh, I'm running out of time. Acts chapter 1 is the invitation. It's the invitation to the process of transformation. He could have been like, guys, the Holy Spirit's coming now. <laughs> you know, and they all get slain in the Spirit. No, that's not what happened, though. He wanted them to wait. He wanted them to be in one accord. He wanted them to be unified. He wanted, maybe if there was any that were like, you know, Jesus, I just, this ain't for me. I, I, I don't want to wait. I don't want to be in Jerusalem right now. There's crazy stuff going on. I'm out. And so he says, I want you to actually hang out here right now during this celebration, this Jewish celebration. And something is going to shift. Come on, somebody. And then we see Acts chapter 2. So Acts chapter 1 is the invitation, and Acts chapter 2 is the transformation. It says, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord. The Lord loves unity. They were with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound of heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. See, this, was, this is a powerful moment. This was the birth of the church. But think about this just in, in the context of what's happening in, the, in that time. Here's all the disciples. And they're told by Jesus, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. And he didn't say, I want you to wait for this amount of days or for this amount of hours or for, and, and on this day, something's going to happen. He didn't give them a timeline. He just said, wait. <laughs> and I love this because they just, by faith, went and they begin to just pray. They begin to encourage each other in the Lord. They begin to hang out in unity and with that, without having a timetable, without having a, when this is going to transpire, but they just knew that something was going to happen, and they set their hearts on the Lord and, uh, until he came. Come on. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming was not so that they could just keep having little Holy Ghost meetings. <laughs> like... Awesome! Let's be. Let's do this again tomorrow night, guys. <laughs> ah, let's do it again the next night. Let's. People are gonna come to us. We're gonna have a revival meeting, and everybody's gonna come into our upper room, and it's gonna. They're gonna get blasted. And there's nothing wrong with that. I believe in powerful meetings where people just show up and get whacked by the Lord. And but that wasn't the purpose of Acts chapter two. The purpose was to get so filled and renewed by the Holy Spirit that you could not keep it inside anymore. That you had to break out of the four walls of the church and bring real transformation to the society around you, to your neighbors, 
to wicked leaders and begin to challenge the customs of the day and begin to challenge the ideologies of the day with the Word of God. And I think now, more than any time in, in American history at least, we need a church that will, one, wait upon the Lord, receive power, and go out and make a difference. We need to transform our world. We need to transform our school system. We need to transform all the wickedness out there. And we can no longer hide anymore. God is calling us in this dark time to be a light, to rise up. You know, two, I was talking about this a few weeks ago, but two people that have been so just heavy on my heart in church history, Corey Tim Boom and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And they, it was during World War II and there was so much craziness and chaos and, and fear and death just swirling around. And, and they just chose to go against the grain. But the thing I love about Dietrich Bonhoeffer is the first, he kind of came under the pressure of society. He came under the pressure of his peers. He came under the pressure of other churches and other Christians to be quiet, to not change anything, to don't rock the boat. And then all of a sudden they had Nazi Germany that just was going crazy, killing the Jews. And uh, it was just, it was horrible. And so he flees to America where he has safety, but the, he, he gets so challenged and so convicted that he goes back to Germany in the battle zone, begins to preach Jesus, begins to bring reformation and transformation. He's, he's I mean, it was just, the story is phenomenal. Corey Tim Boom was rescuing so many Jews and putting them in the basement of her home, which they called the hiding place. Right? And she would just hide them, and, and they would rescue them. And, and I, I was listening to this interview with Catherine Coleman and Corey Tim Boom, and she's interviewing her, and she's just telling these stories of grace and how this one particular moment she was, she was tortured and she was beaten and she was taken to a concentration camp with 500 other women. Her and her sister, they're in this, this concentration camp, and they're, they don't know if they're going to die, but they've been beaten a lot. And they don't want to see, Corey Tim Boom doesn't want to go to sleep because there's, there's lice and there's all these bugs all over the, in the place where the people sleep. And, and she said, I cannot sleep in there. I, I, it's, it's disgusting. It's dirty. It's filthy. I don't, I don't want to do this. And her sister says, no, we will do this. God's grace is sufficient for us right now. And so they begin to just do life with these 500 other women and nobody, no guards would come to check on them because they didn't want to get lice and all these creepy crawly things and so they left them alone and so they begin to preach the gospel to these 500 women every day and they begin to have church services and Bible studies and they begin to see salvations all throughout that concentration camp Hallelujah looking for a couple people to stand in America right now. Amen. Back to the ladybug farm. So we watch this transformation take place, and it's a beautiful transformation. There are these awesome little bugs and and now it's time to uh, let them go. And so we bring them outside and we kind of take them by some roses. And we open up the cap and, and a bunch just fly out. And they just like, boom, like they just come alive. They're like, hallelujah, I was born for this, you know. And I, and I just love, it was like really cool to watch that because it's like, it's inside of all creation to be free. They just knew, like they just knew once they got out of that, they knew what to do. They knew they knew they were born for that. And they just begin, it was like instinctual, and they just begin to do their thing. And but as we're watching them, I noticed that there was a few that didn't want to leave. <laughs> I'm like, come on. Come on, little guy. <laughs> you can do it. And but they became content 
in the environment that we had made. <laughs> they became content with the good, not realizing that what out there was great. God speak to me, spoke to me. He just says, sometimes you need to be willing to let go of the good to embrace what I'm about to do in your life. Abraham had to let go of what was behind to step into a beautiful, powerful season that would literally change the world. And he would be known in the scriptures as the father of our faith. But he had to let go of a good season first to embrace a better season. I know many times in my life, I, there's been times, and it's, it's, isn't it funny? I've experienced this time and time again. I, I remember going to Mongolia, and, uh, you know, I used to tell, I remember I, I really wanted to go to Africa. And I felt like I was called to go to Africa. And, and then all of a sudden, I had this stirring to go to Asia, and I felt that I was supposed to go to, to Mongolia. But I'm like, I was fighting it. I don't want to go to Mongolia. And then I finished Bible college, and they said, oh, we, we've been praying, and we really feel like you're going to Mongolia. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go to Mongolia. But I, I go over there, and uh, I fly over, and I, I begin to live among the people. And, and at first, you know, every part of me was dying. You know, there's a real death process when you go overseas, and you're living in a different culture, and you just want a Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> just want a cheeseburger. <laughs> I'm like, um, but, you know, so there was this death process, and, and uh, where was I even going with that? Keep playing. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> See, when he plays, I just kind of keep going all these fun bunny trails. Um, a better season is coming. A better season. Thank you, Patrick. So I was, in, I was in Mongolia, and at first, when the first several months, I, I loved the people, but I hated being there. And I just wanted my year to be over. I wanted to just finish it, and I wanted to get back to America. Uh, but after about eight or nine months, there was a real shift that began to happen in my heart. And I began to fall in love with the people, and I began to fall in love with the nation. And I knew I was going to go back, and so I went back for a second year. I went back for a third year, and about two and a half years in, I had this heart change. It was a real shift, and I said, I'm going to live here for the rest of my life. And, and it was like in that moment, as soon as I kind of came to that place, I heard the Holy Spirit whisper to me, I need you to go back to America. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I just settled in here, Lord. Like, my heart is ready to be here. I've, I've changed. He's like, yes, you've changed, and now you're ready to move on. And many times I think the problems in our life is like we, we get so comfortable in a season, and we get so comfortable in our surroundings that we're, we, it's impossible to let it go because we have this death grip on it. And the Lord's like, just release it. Release it. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. It's going to be okay. Hallelujah. Amen. So in order for these little ladybugs to reach their full potential, they had to get out of this environment that I had made for them, that, that our family had made for them. And, and, and they begin to just go crazy and, and, and in a good way and, and live. But they had to let go. Look at your neighbor and say, let go. five you can close your, just close your eyes with me the theme through scripture is wait Wait, wait in faith. 
Don't get discouraged when you see somebody get their miracle. Be encouraged because yours is coming. There's so much that's about to take place in each and every one of your lives. And and the thing that we just have to wrestle with and kind of just get a handle on is that we're all in process in different areas of our life. Whether that's you've been believing for a miracle in your physical body, I just decree and declare over you that miracle is coming. And we look at the miracle, and that's the thing. It's like I've seen miracles where it's like it's happened instantly right before my eyes, where the bones and a man a man came to me for prayer, and, and his hand had just been crushed by a tire, a car tire. The, bo- the bones in his hand were totally crushed, and he comes to this meeting, and he asks me to pray for his hand, and I really didn't have a whole lot of faith, but I knew that Jesus was a healer, but I'm like, okay, and I just laid hands on him, and I, I had somewhere to go, but I laid hands on him, I prayed a prayer of faith, and I could feel bones shifting underneath my hand. I could feel it happening right there, but the guy's hand had been crushed for quite some time, and so there was like this, there's waiting, this crying out, this, God, I need a miracle, and we don't know all the stuff that goes on. We just, we just look at the instant miracle or the, the miracles and we're like, oh man, I wish my life was like that. The woman with the issue of blood had to wait. The blind men were waiting. And we need to wait. But wait with faith and wait with a heart that's just set on him. Father, we just thank you for today. I thank you for Pentecost Sunday, Lord, that that those that were invited into the upper room, they chose to wait upon you in unity. And they didn't get discouraged when you didn't come in an hour, when you didn't come the next day, when you didn't come in six days. They didn't get discouraged and say, I got to leave. They just kept waiting. And they kept believing because they stood upon your words. Because your words are always yes and amen. And I just break off every single person in this room who has had a man-made timetable. And a man-made timeline that you've put on certain prophetic words. I feel like there's people in this room right now, you've had prophetic words spoken over you. And you begin to attach a timeline to that. When this needs to take place. When this is going to get walked out. And the Lord said, I don't think so. I didn't put a date on that. I just gave you the promise. And so remove that date and allow hope and faith to rush into your heart right now. (laughs) Allow the hope of God to just flood over you. The wind of God to breathe in this place, to blow in this house in the mighty name of Jesus. So right now we just say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and just breathe in this church. Just blow on your church, God. Blow on your people. Blow on our situations. On our situations, on our brokenness, on our disappointments. God, on our process. Wherever we are in our process. And sometimes you need some encouragement along the way. Abraham, there was three times where he needed encouragement and he needed reminding of the promise. And so if there's anybody in this room right now, just lift your hands and your heart and your eyes to Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here and you say, I just need some encouragement from heaven right now. I just want you to receive from the Father as we just sing this closing song. There's others that have been waiting. You've been waiting for that that child to come back into the house of God. You've been waiting for the prodigal to return. Others have been waiting for a miracle. There's something so beautiful about waiting because waiting is believing. My heart will not be in fear. My heart will not be tossed to and fro, but I will stand in faith no longer how long it takes because I believe. 
no matter what comes my way, I will trust. My daughter was sick and I wanted an instant miracle. I wanted to see it disappear that day. It didn't happen that day, but there was something supernatural and powerful that took place over the next eight months. And she has been eight years cancer free. And so there was this there was this process that we got to walk. And it's like it's in the it's in those painful moments that your roots begin to go deep down. And if you'll just begin to lean in, I just, there's for somebody right now, if you begin to lean into this season as a family, you're going to just be so connected. There's going to be a connection and an intimacy and uh, just relationships restored as you begin to lean into this thing together. So, Father, I just thank you for that right now. Help us to wait. Help us to take hope. Help us to take courage. Remind people today of the promise. And if there's others in this room, like you read Acts chapter 2, and you said, I, I, I've never received anything that they're talking about, this thing about speaking in tongues and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's, it is a gift, and, and you can have it. He doesn't force it on you. He doesn't make you have it. You can go to heaven without the gift of the Holy Spirit. But, but why, why would you reject it? <laughs> Jesus has just offered the best gift that he can give you next to his son. I would just say, give me all you have for me, Lord. And so if there's anybody in this room, I just feel like some need a reminder and some need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. And so we're just going to sing just for a few minutes and we'll wrap up. I just want everybody, eyes closed, hands lifted, wherever you are in your your life. Um, If you need a touch, if you need a word, just connect with the Father right now. And he's going to give you what he needs. If you ask for bread, he will not give you a stone. He's a good father. So let's just connect with him just for a few minutes.